News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. And very good evening to you and a warm welcome to Newsline Live. Now then, the economic crisis demands a fresh mandate. That appears to be the call from a growing number of the public who are in touch with us in different different ways. And uh, so to describe that, uh, to discuss that, we've got here today our guest this evening, a um, <coughs> uh, sorry, a senior hand with the SJB, uh, former banker and uh, turned politician, Mr. Iran Wickramatna. Very good evening, Iran. Thank you for coming. Good evening. <coughs> now then, uh, our president, um, being prime minister and uh, being the president, about 80 days in the making now. But 80 days later, the Minister of Finance doesn't seem to have an appetite to present a plan for recovery. It's all, with all due respect, it's all a bit of waffle. We expect it to happen. We expect this. We expect that. Where is the nitty gritties? Doesn't the, is, the, is the president basically planning for disaster or is he planning to help the people who can't afford three square meals? Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, yes, it's going to be three months, as you said, uh, soon hmm. since the uh, new president, new government has taken office. Uh, it's a very challenging task that's before them because it's a bankrupt country. Uh, and then how do you actually turn it around? So uh, there are no quick answers, whoever is in government, in how it's going to be turned around. But at least you have to get on the right path to recovery. The question that I have is that are we on the right path? Right? And I still can't see that we are on the right path. Uh, because there are so many reforms that are needed, mm. right? and if the government is unable to do those reforms, then I think uh, sooner they go home the better, mm. rather than delay the process. Otherwise, they should just get on with the reforms very, very quickly, without delaying it, without postponing it, and so forth. Mm. Uh, if I were to uh, say it uh, very succinctly, there are political and social reforms, and there are economic reforms. Mm. If I were to just focus on the economic reforms, right? There are expenditure reforms, revenue reforms, which need to be done very quickly so that the budget could be better balanced. But and for all this, we need a plan. Uh, yes, of course, you need a plan and you need a plan and you need execution as well. Yes, there's no yeah. point having committees without the execution part of it. Yeah, so Sri Lanka <coughs> has generally lots of discussions on policy, lots of discussions on plan. Uh, Lots of discussions on how to borrow, uh, how to get money from your friends. Yeah, but uh, often we fail on implementation. So mm. if I give you some very quick example, uh, normally when we looked at fiscal, the fiscal side and the problem, the budget deficit, uh, in our period we looked at getting revenue. So you increase taxes, you get revenue, you look at efficiencies, increase in the tax net, all that kind of thing, which we actually did during our period. But this time you had to look at expenditures as well. Here are the big challenges. When you look at expenditures, you let look at state-owned enterprises. Huge loss-making state-owned enterprises, mm. right? Uh, what do you do with them? So clearly, some of the reforms will entail, some of them need to be closed. Because the state can't do business, mm. full stop. Some needs to be closed, because otherwise the taxpayer is paying for it. And as you said, lots of people are suffering, <coughs> lots of people have problems with income. Right, and uh, then why are they paying for these loss making enterprises? So, Sri Lankan Airlines is one of those, this big question, right? Uh, Sri Lankan Airlines, if I would say it very quickly, 1949 to 1998, basically losses. 1998, it was privatized till 2018. Ten years, taxpayer didn't have to pay anything, it made some profits, but it was out of the hands of the taxpayer, no burden on the taxpayer. Hmm. 2018, president decides to take it over. He hands the management over President Mahindra Rajapaksa to a relative, right, as chairperson, and uh, then others. 28. Tw 2008. Eight, yes, sorry, 2008. 2008. Yeah. 1998 to 2008. <coughs> yeah. Right. 
and then basically the uh, Emirates leaves and after that in the first few years they make Emirates about a, sent back sent back 100 and about 100 billion losses today those losses have amounted to maybe around 300 billion or something mm. now what it actually needs is right what we mean by it should be in private hands is two things we need capital so if the government can't put the capital you need private capital to one mm. second is management must be free now, right and these two need to be accomplished so state owned enterprises reform is needed so one is yeah. some of it you will have to close some of it you will have to get private capital some of it you can do public private partnerships then public sector reform has to be done right and public sector reform is huge take for example defense expenditures defense expenditures are huge right the if you take the expenditure in our budget on education and health together it involves defense right it's equal to defense so defense expenditures something basically needs to be done about defense expenditures then public sector employment something needs to be done about that so expenditure reforms these are the hard decisions that Rani Vikramasinghe the new president mm. has to take there's no point talking about it because if he can't go the reform route and actually change things around then I think the legitimacy of parliament is at stake it's already at stake surely it's already at stake but because he was a new <coughs> president you know people are giving a certain well I mean uh, 80 days is a long time for a company uh, for a country facing such a serious uh, economic crisis uh, to give as a sort of honeymoon period surely 80 days is a bit much yeah so I, I, I all I'm saying is that the people have given a space and the reforms need to be done. So those were the, on the expenditure side. The but reforms. you all haven't helped, have you? You, you? you all haven't joined his call to have a national government. I we, know you told me why. But yeah, uh, well, well, we, we, we are helping in this sense. We have said we won't take positions because we have no mandate mm. to take the positions. Therefore, we will be in opposition and we will help him. So being in opposition, we can play our role. So, but right? what are you, how are you helping him? Right, for, for, for example, right, he has a lot of reforms to do and I talked about the expenditure reforms, they are revenue reforms mm. and then, right, this is the first time that economic crimes have surfaced at the United Nations Human Rights Council discussion. Indeed. Right, economic crimes. Then in the IMF, right, at the early stage, it has been highlighted that there is corruption and there should be measures put in to basically uh, minimize corruption right now how do we help you're asking me the question directly right now for example parliament has standing committees in mm. parliament mm. and we play a positive role in those standing committees and in those standing committees in fact uh, uh, we, we want to play a leading role uh, we will play it constructively right mm. in COPE and in COPA in particular and uh, also we, the, the committee on public finance has already begun its work but the other two committees haven't been appointed over these three months, mm. right? Uh, uh, but they are basically to begin work this week, and they have an important work, uh, work to do, and particularly in COPE, which I have been involved. Uh, that's where wastage, corruption, mismanagement, mm. all comes in there of these institutions, and there are about 350 institutions. Billions and billions of losses are being made, and there's corruption, and therefore. Uh, we will play our role positively there, right, in COPE because it affects the poor person in this country in particular, but it affects everybody mm. because taxpayers are paying for that corruption and for that mismanagement. But, uh, why is it, Iran um, Vikramatna, uh, that when the World Bank, the IMF and uh, say the ADB even, when they are talking with the government of Sri Lanka, why can't they suggest, instead of demand, suggest something to control political funding? The root cause of corruption is when it comes to political funding. We need some laws to control that. Yeah. Something on the lines of maybe Singapore's uh, Political Donations Act. Yeah, so, so uh, certainly that is one of the laws that needs to be brought in uh, and uh, it's about you know, funding political parties and individuals and their campaign. 
uh, that law needs to be brought in because if the law is not brought in uh, the declarations will not happen, the limits will not come in. And so, I think you raised an important point Shaukat, you know it is like you know if I am funded by certain corporations yeah. right, and companies, yeah. then I am less likely to speak against it naturally because they are funding me personally. But if there are laws, they cannot fund me or what they can fund me is limited, the public knows about it and therefore, it makes me also free to talk about it. And that is why, right? Now, for example, you take COPE, which I said I was involved in, yeah. right? Uh, we, we have some institution comes before us. Why aren't you the chairman of COPE? Well, the chairman of COPE uh, in, in this parliament is yet to be appointed, and mm. that's uh, basically that election in COPE is due tomorrow. In COPE, it's uh, uh, due uh, next uh, Thursday, that's the day after, right? And, and, and Traditionally, who should be? Yeah, it, it works like this. In the Committee on Public Finance, Shaukert, mm. the standing order says it has to be a member of the opposition. And therefore, Harsha De Silva, as a member of the opposition, is chairman of that. Mm. In COPE and COPA, they, the standing order is not that. In COPA and COPA, the committee gets together and decides who should be the chairman. Mm. Now, normally, it is normal that yeah, the, cha the, the majority in the committee is government. It mm. does not matter which government, the majority yeah. is government. Yeah. And therefore, if you have a vote, yeah. then the government, generally the government nominee gets in. Yeah. But what we have done in the past is, we have tried to create a certain tradition and a precedent. Mm -hmm. And that is to put a member of the opposition as the chairman or the chairperson of that committee. Mm. And there is a reason for it. Mm. The reason is this, right? If you take political, modern political theory of a good democracy, yeah. you have the executive arm separate from the legislative arm and the judiciary. So, you have two systems. Now, if you take the US system for example, you have a president, he is the executive, you have the House of Representatives and the Senate in the US. Mm -hmm. But the president once he is elected, he brings his cabinet from outside the House of Representatives and the Senate. If you are a senator and you are joining the cabinet of the president, you cease to be a senator, you resign and then only he can appoint you. So, separation of powers between the executive and the legislature. In the so, West, their cabinet ministers are not, polit not necessarily elected politicians? They are not, they are not, they right. cannot be because of separation of powers. But in the Westminster system, the cabinet comes out of the members of parliament. Yeah. In Sri Lanka, the cabinet is out of the members of parliament. So, there is a bit of a mix there. Now, because of that, because of that mix, it is particularly important that parliament has two main responsibilities. One is making law mm. and the other is parliament is responsible for every rupee. Therefore, standing committees of parliament like COPE and COPA right, should be therefore independent to play its legislative role. It is not an executive role and therefore, because of this mix of the executive and the legislature, it is particularly important that the, those committees should be chaired by members of the opposition for that reason. There is a reason mm. why it should be chaired by members of the opposition. So, even though there are no standing orders about it, uh, when the United National Party has been in office, right, we have invited uh, people who have been in opposition. I think, I think Vijay Das Rajapaks was in opposition when he was appointed, Sunil Hadunneti was in opposition mm. and, and while we were in government, we appointed members of the opposition to do that. I think it is important for that reason and it is also to check and balance. Mm. It is particularly important now because the people in this country have been in the streets. They have basically got rid of a president, got rid of a government and they have asked for a change. Corruption has been a big issue in this country mm. and therefore, I think parliamentarians, we all need to be sensitive to the issue. Shaukat, it is not about the individual, it is mm. not about Iran, Vikram, Ratnayri, individual. The individual really does not matter in this. But people are looking for genuine change and people are looking that we will do that responsibility as members of parliament. Shaukat, I said this in parliament today, we are running short of time, right? If people do not see that all of us collectively, that is mm. why we are supporting the government, playing those roles also, we are supporting the government. Mm. If they do not see that genuinely we are tackling the issues, including the issue of corruption, and that we are not, you know, friends getting together and helping each other, safeguarding each other, mm. right? I, I, because that, 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 that is there, out there. People are thinking like that. Indeed, it, it's, it's in everybody's interest, right? 
that the checks and balances are put in place and, and the standing committees of parliament and members of the opposition who are actually chairpersons of it. Thank you very much, uh, Eran Vikramat. Obviously, uh, the politicians are struggling, uh, and, uh, or rather, uh, Sri Lanka is struggling, but the politicians are juggling. Let's take a quick break and uh, take a peek at this evening's headline news. And uh, we come back um, and we'll have a very special uh, guest uh, telling us about a very significant matter that's going on whilst parliamentarians and the government are juggling. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. A trusted place for your fixed deposit. Valuable FD, 25% for two months. 25.5% for four months. Valuable FD, the symbol of stability. Water cannons and tear gas on IUSF protest march against suppression. <laughs> Sarat Fonseca joins IUSF protest march. Marika exposed fraud in crude and refined oil imports. Opposition pushes Charida Herat into court. 30% tax on export companies, an agreement with the IMF, revelation at COPA. CID chief summoned to parliament for allegedly tapping Partley's phone. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with Mr. Eran Vikramatna from the SJB. Mr. Vikramatna, honestly, the people, of course, we know um, are struggling. The president has tried and he's, obviously he's failed in his attempt to have a national government. Uh, your party has its uh, reasons, very sound too. You don't want to be associated with people of uh, questionable integrity and so on. But doesn't all this mean that the legitimacy of parliament and its members has now completely eroded? And it's now time. Whatever the cost, financial and any other cost, the people really, I'm sure, Elections is what we want. Is that about right? Uh, I agree with you on this, that, uh, you know, there's a question about the legitimacy mm. of parliament. There was a question about the legitimacy of Gotabe Rajapaksa, though he was a legal president. And basically he had to go, right? And of course, there's lots of things that he will have to answer as well mm. because of the mess the country has got into. Similarly, there are questions about parliament that people are asking, it may be legal, but is it actually legitimate? Now, if the government is going to do the reforms and do it quickly, mm. it might be able to claw back some of the legitimacy because mm. it's doing the reforms, it's getting onto the right path. But if we can't see that moving that fast, I think there is only one way that eventually legitimacy can return. And that is by going back to the people because the people are suffering and then let the people decide who they think can actually resolve these problems. And that's, that's very, very critical and very, very important. Sri Lanka has a lot of politicians. They can take a microphone, they can speak and do things like that. But where the country generally fails for us is it has poor governance. There are very few people who understand how to govern. There's a difference between being a politician and being somebody who can govern. You know, even companies have good sales eggs, people who can sell the company, sell the brand, build the brand and so forth. But it takes a lot more than that to be the CEO of the company or to be in the senior management to work out the strategy and to put the plans down, implement the plans, make sure over time it happens. Mm. That's the governance part and the management part. That's where this country has failed. Look at it from the beginning. Look at it from the beginning. Clever politicians take a mic, they can speak, people will cheer, clap, this, that. What is the result at the end of the day? So yes. draw, I draw a distinction between being a politician and being able to govern. This country basically has had poor governance because the leaders have generally failed on governance. Uh, I might want to add a bit more to what you've just said. I think clever politicians should also uh, not only be able to speak um, and uh, act and so on, but they must also have something else with them. 
and which is the ability to listen. Um, because, you know, we've got two, and there's only one of this. So, um, I, uh, do you think that part of the problem, or maybe the problem, is that politicians who, are, who make up the government of the day, um, don't, they lose their ability to listen to the people, to hear what the people are saying? I, I think it's only half the problem, Faraz. Listening is very important, granted, mm. but you need to also have the ability to govern education, the skills, the experience, all that is important. Examine our leaders from independence to, to now, mm. right? Sri Lanka has failed on that. Listening, clearly you need to be a listener, but you also have to have the ability to govern. And uh, talking about listening to the people, uh, we are going to be joined now by the uh, exec executive group director of the Kapil Maharaj group at, um, and uh, the, of course uh, my boss um, in charge here at News First, uh, Mr. Shavan Daniel. Um, very good evening to you, Mr. Daniel. Good evening for us and good evening Iran as well. Good evening. Now, uh, Shavan, today um, the, the government, the movement, which is uh, uh, a decade old, and today um, we're starting for the sixth time uh, the door-to-door -door campaign. Um, tell me, um, Shavan, what, what do we hope to achieve on this, the sixth time round, door-to-door? Well, for us, um, I think Gamadha's philosophy is um, action out of truth. And the only way to assess the truth is um, by knowing the facts. And the only way to know the facts is to, um, in, the, in this sense, is to go to the people and uh, uh, quieten yourself and listen. Uh, and the only way to do that is to go deep into rural Sri Lanka and spend time with our people, which we've been doing for years and years and years. Kamada itself is over a decade now. And um, the late chairman, his um, challenge to us from the very beginning was uh, to keep our mouths shut and listen to the people, hear what they have to say. And we've been able to do that with the Peradini University helping us uh, collate the information that we uh, get from rural Sri Lanka and then turn that into um, usable information, uh, credible information, and then try to do what we can to resolve some of these perennial problems. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to go back to the village this year as well. We missed out last year because um, of everything that was going on, the restrictions. But this year, despite all of the challenges and all of the obstacles, uh, we've, we're very pleased to have been supported by some very important people, very key people, um, to help us and support us go to the village and um, do our door-to-door -door campaign for the sixth time. It must have been uh, uh, pretty significantly challenging, uh, the logistics in a country where we are challenged for fuel and so on and so forth. Uh, how, how have you managed to overcome this? Well, I think um, Gamadha has um, been functioning right throughout all of the lockdowns and um, everything else, all of the other challenges that we've faced over the past two years. We've actually accelerate our work, accelerated our work. We've uh, managed to hand over hundreds and hundreds of projects to uh, rural Sri Lankans and Sri Lankan communities. We've been able to do this because the real strength of Gamadha is the people themselves. Uh, many of your viewers, for us, in fact, have supported us. And um, there's no one person or one individual or one corporate or company that um, is behind Gamadha. It's the whole of Sri Lanka, in fact. It's the smallest donations that mean the most to us. And because of that, we've been able to keep working and, uh, in fact, increase the amount of work that we do. And secondly, we have an absolutely amazing team that's motivated, full of young people who are just, um, you know, tearing at the bit, in a sense, to go down, go, go down to the village and do what they can to uplift um, our communities. So it's a combination of being supported by the people and also uh, young leaders who are very creative in how they overcome challenges and obstacles. And um, 
Would you agree when we say that Gamad is the people? Oh yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. And I think that was what uh, was always uh, planned and the intention. Gamad is far beyond just being uh, a CSR program. It's a movement now. In fact, um, that's emblematic in the fact that. Uh, international seats of learning like uh, Brown University, which is um, one of America's most prestigious Ivy League schools, um, has partnered with Gammatha and in fact is teaching its students about Gammatha. And also similarly, the Clinton School of Public Service has partnered with Gammatha and many other universities around the world. Are, uh, well, they consider Gammatha to be a very unique uh, initiative in which communities and the people have come together to solve uh, communal problems in a very unique and innovative way. And I think the credit goes to the people of Sri Lanka, the communities that we work with, because we've never come across corruption or um, inefficiency. The people always ask for um, solutions to communal problems. You know. Uh, in my experience traveling to thousands and thousands of Sri Lankan villages, it's very, very rare that we come across even the poorest of families that ask for something for themselves. They always point out problems that uh, will benefit, solutions rather, that would benefit the village. And that's something very special. Um, so we're looking forward to going into people's homes and as... Um, a very interesting and uh, uh, a very intelligent religious leader I met today pointed out we're not only going into homes but we're going into people's lives so very cognizant of the responsibility that comes with it. Uh, Shimon Daniel, thank you very much uh, for joining uh, Newsline and telling us all about uh, the latest door-to-door uh, -door um, a campaign being done by Gamad to listen, to hear what the people have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for us. Thank you. Um, there you go, um, Aaron. Uh, like we were talking before, here's the ability to listen to the people. And there are people who are, honestly, they, ha they appear to have been forgotten. Sri Lanka's forgotten people. People who, uh, you know, just off Kalawan Chikudi, who probably get washed, their homes get washed away at least twice a year. And the, the children there, uh, I met a girl who hung her school books on the top uh, so that the minute the floods came, she'd take the books and off they went. And they walk uh, several kilometers to the school and so on. Uh, the transport system is barely existing. What can we do to, for the people? They are, after all, our people. Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to say congratulations to Shervan and to Gammadda and everybody involved in it uh, for the work that they have been doing. I came from the private sector myself and uh, I realized the importance of corporate social responsibility and uh, uh, what they are doing by actually going to the villages. We politicians, we are often dealing with the policy level, but actually you must never lose the touch and feel. So going to villages, meeting people, understanding what's on the ground and how the movement has grown, it's something appreciate, highly appreciated. I would even go ahead and say this, that otherwise there's a belief in this country that governments can solve every problem, governments can do everything. This is a myth. Right. Civil society is important, the private sector is important, and social you know, responsibility executed by the private sector is important. So I will say I, I wish them well, and some of those learnings, because it was interesting to hear Shavan say that some of the universities are actually studying Indeed. what has been done, but some of those learnings might be useful in actually us really putting it as an input into our policy formulation as well, because eventually we want to make life better for all Sri Lankans and Sri Lankans living in those villages. We want to do that. Thank you very much, Iran Vikramaratna, for your time on Newsline Live. It's now time for the prime time news. And um, before I leave you, as always, God bless you all.